Hello, everyone, and welcome to one of our DCLI events here in the multicultural room. In the back, you are going to enjoy the murals that were created by high school talent from Pittsburgh, from Kappa. I'm going to introduce the panel that um, um, is here assembled with us to talk about whether American common law has any Roman law roots. And uh, I'm going to start uh, with um, Dr. Barron. And it's very good that in addition to uh, digital tools, I have printout notes. <laughs> So uh, Dr. Sarah Barron has been the Duquesne University Librarian since 2015. And before she was the University Library Dean of Regent University. Dr. Barron has a Master's of Science from the University of North, North Texas. And in 2009 was the recipient of Platinum Star Award for distinguished alumni from the College of Information and Library Science and Technologies at the University of North Texas. She earned a Doctor of Education from UMass in Boston with a dissertation entitled Employee Perspectives of Library and Information Technology Mergers, The Recursiveness of Structure, Culture, and Agency. Dr. Barron, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. And it's wonderful to be here. Good afternoon. My job today is to welcome you um, on behalf of our libraries. Um, so my name is Sarah. I'm the university librarian at Gumberg Library right across the street. And um, we are thrilled that you're here along with the Duquesne Center for Legal Information and um, the Allegheny County Law Library. Welcome to this event. Um, National Archives Month was last month, was October. It, it just <laughs> ended. And National Archives Month is a time to celebrate unique materials of enduring research value. And about six months ago, Dr. Don Agnescu discovered a rare monograph at the Allegheny County Law Library, and it's sitting right over there. What ensued after that discovery was an exciting race to ensure this incanabula would be protected, secure, and shared. And that's why we're here today. The result is this program where we are sharing with you this book and celebrating the value, the beauty, and just the all around awesomeness of this book. Um, it's a 1488 rare incanabula, the Coburger imprint of Justinian's Code. So I hope that you enjoy the presentations that we'll be having today in the panel. There will be lots of time for Q&A, as well as for you to touch the book if you have clean hands. <laughs> um, so I will turn it back over to Donna to continue introducing our speakers. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, and uh, I know that uh, Dr. Barron has to leave um, around one o'clock to attend another conference <laughs> where she is a speaker. Um, Professor Hibbets is with us. And um, uh, Professor Hibbets will talk about Justinian's attorneys, Roman law and American lawyers. He is a graduate of Toronto University of Oxford University in Harvard Law. Professor Hibbets is a law professor at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law and the publisher and editor in chief of Jurist, the online legal news service powered by a staff of over 80 law students from 30 law schools on six continents, and uh, he founded Jurist at Pitt Law in 1996. Professor Pivot and Newland, honor to have you here. Thank you very much, Donna. I appreciate the opportunity, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm going to lead off today with a discussion of uh, a group that I've called Justinian's Attorneys. Uh, because in this context, I want to talk about Roman law and its impact on American lawyers over the years. Uh, and I want to begin by taking you to the West Pediment of the Supreme Court. Because if you look carefully at that West Pediment, you'll see two figures uh, surrounding uh, another at the, at the center. Uh, one on the left is an English knight. And that might be predictable given the importance of the English common law to American legal tradition. The one on the right side, though, is a Roman centurion. And of course, that reminds us that. American law has had another source, another influence playing upon it, and that, of course, is Roman law. So we can talk, if we want to talk, about America's Roman law tradition, but what I really want to do today is talk about two different traditions Roman law, or Roman law uh, play uh, in this country, historically and perhaps still uh, to this very uh, moment. First, I want to begin with what I'm calling the Republican tradition, which really flourished in the late 18th and early 19th century. 
supported, of course, by the classical curriculum, which was dominant in the universities at the time. Uh, someone like John Adams would have been certainly a beneficiary of that tradition of the curriculum. Um, and in, in, he was training for the bar, reading for the bar. He was reading Justinian, among other things. And here he is talking to his diary, talking to himself to some extent in 1758 about his readings in Justinian and how he was struggling with that. To some extent, he was born in Braintree, Massachusetts, by the way, which is why he's Justinian in Braintree uh, here. But the other, of course, was playing on uh, Adams at this time was Cicero. Uh, and Adams always saw himself as something of an American Cicero and actually had a chance to perform in that role. He lost a massive trial in 1770, which of course uh, he was successful in very consciously uh, modeling his speech in that particular case on Cicero's orations, his legal orations. And of course, in this context, we're talking about Cicero and, and, and Roman law to some extent of Roman advocacy as a counterweight to power. Uh, and uh, the, the, the uh, importance of Cicero in Republican tradition and Republican history of Rome is obvious. Um, now, when you get to the constitutional period, uh, you still see American lawyers talking, incidentally at least, about Roman models, Roman ideals. They were much more interested in those ideals than they were in Greek ideals at the time, which they thought were rather dangerous. They were not fans of Athenian democracy or anything else like this. You do see references coming up occasionally to Roman circumstances in history and even law in the Federalist Papers. Um, John Adams, uh, at the very end of his life, actually had himself uh, depicted uh, as a Roman. This is a, a bust that was done of Adams in 1825, the year before he died. He is appearing as a Roman here. Uh, the, uh, the, the face was actually taken from a life mask. So here is Adams at the end being a Roman. Uh, but even before this time, Adams was conscious that the classical tradition in the United States was beginning to decline. And you can't quite see it easily on this slide, but in the last line of this particular letter, he's talking about decline of, of Greek and Latin. And he's saying this is not a good thing. He's concerned about this in the long run because those are the carriers, obviously, of the classical tradition. He's not sure that without the languages, the tradition, the tradition can continue. Now, ultimately, there is a shift, there is a change. And uh, in the American context, you see after Adams' death, the decades after Adams' death, uh, a movement towards um, Greek culture. There is a general Greek revival. Uh, this actually is a picture of the burned out remnants of the second courthouse here in, in Pittsburgh, uh, which was modeled along Greek lines quite literally. The, the, the plot downtown is actually the current Allegheny County courthouse, which was built over this. Um, and in this other picture earlier here, you see Rufus Choate, one of the most prominent Massachusetts lawyers of the 1830s and 40s, with a bust of the laws that is behind him. And that just reminds us that what we're seeing here is a change in the rhetorical models which American lawyers are drawing from. They're moving from Cicero to Demosthenes, two different styles of presentation, and that has implications of its own. Um, the Civil War sort of accelerated the decline of Roman lawyer and Roman law and the reputation generally of that. Uh, subject, uh, the fact that Roman law was deployed in defense of slavery didn't help uh, prior to that time. But it's after the Civil War, the classical curriculum that Adams grew up with really comes apart in a variety of ways. So in this context, this is kind of a, an interregnum where the, the Roman law tradition in America is, is sublimated somewhat, not coming to the fore. A number of things are also reinforcing this. Uh, rhetoric is declining as a legal art form, so that doesn't help necessarily, especially during the Ciceronian tradition. Also, uh, natural law is giving away to positivism in a variety of different ways. Uh, and again, that plays against some of what had carried Roman law before. However, Roman lawyers do rediscover American law in the 1890s. Uh, and this is what I call the imperial tradition, roughly uh, being dominant between about 1890 and 1950. Uh, and it's happening, this rediscovery of Roman law is happening at the same time as American power is growing internationally, right? So this is a time when literally Roman arches are being raised to triumphant American generals in New York. This is the Dewey Arch uh, in New York, which was a temporary structure put up to celebrate Admiral Dewey when he came back from the, uh, the Philippines. So in this context, U.S. lawyers, at least some of them, are rediscovering Roman law, but the rediscovery is on slightly different terms than it was before, because now this is Justinian they're paying attention to, not so much Cicero. 
So the model has changed, the orientation has changed during this time. And we're no longer thinking about law as a counterweight to power, we're thinking about law as an instrument of power. And the popularity or the rising popularity, it's all relative, of course, but the rising popularity of, uh, of, of Roman law uh, in the US during this period is heavily influenced by Germany. You see a lot of scholarship coming up in Germany during this period focusing on Justinian. They, of course, are looking for a unifying influence to some extent. Remember, the Germany is just coming together in the later 19th century uh, from its previous sort of dissociated condition. Um, uh, Roman law is also increasingly prominent in English legal education at this point. Uh, you see it coming somewhat more to the fore uh, in places like Oxford during this period. And the fact that there are increasing ties between the elite UK schools, Oxford basically, and US law schools helps to bring Roman law again into the American uh, legal education system. And when it comes in and when American lawyers get hold of it, they once again are looking at Roman law as a bit of a nation builder, something that can help draw together the, the, the many bits, the many jurisdictions uh, that the United States has developed by this particular period. What's interesting on the legal education side is that Roman law in American law schools surges during these years. Now the surge is again relative, right? So it's not everybody at all, but eight schools out of 56 are teaching Roman law in uh, 1893. Uh, if that were today, we'd see 25 uh, in the law schools, maybe more, 30, uh, you know, teaching on the law here, which just does not happen today. Uh, it was even on the bar exam, not just in Louisiana, but actually in Kansas uh, in 1893, uh, into the 1900s. Uh, Roman law increasingly shows up in the US Supreme Court. This is not a definitive list, but this is a, a selected group of uh, relatively significant cases which draw from Roman law during this period. Um, Roman law is also increasingly used to support the idea and ideal of American codification, codifying American law. Remember, we're talking about Justinian here. And so you've got experts like William Burdick, who is actually in Kansas, which is one of the reasons why Kansas had Roman law in the bar exam, uh, being brought in explicitly to work on the earliest versions of the U.S. code because he had that training, because he had that background. He knew what a code was to some extent. Therefore, he was brought in to do this kind of work. The restatements that start in the early 20th century also build very explicitly on Roman law. And you actually see here in one of the American Law Institute's uh, initial explanations of what they were doing. Um, that uh, Roman law was a model for them, it was largely through restatement. Uh, this introduction says that the Roman law had acquired its harmony. So they are going to that for a particular reason. At the same time, Americans themselves are beginning to translate Justinian. This is Fred Bloom, who uh, was over Wyoming during this time, and he's getting directly into the text now. Other people had done that, right? But he's getting into the text himself. And again, there's a reason for this, there's a context. It is not insignificant that when we're talking about the literal construction of the Supreme Court building in the 1930s, uh, you are seeing basically a, a, a Roman temple of one sort. Uh, the, the, there is a resonance here. Uh, and of course, on the other side, I've got the remaining columns of the Temple of Saturn from the Roman Forum. Uh, if you go into the court and look at the doors, uh, you see a variety of depictions of Roman things, right? Roman situations. So if you look at the left side here, three out of those four depictions are Rome, right? The Shield of Achilles is a trial scene. That's there, but the other things are Roman. And then you get to the English stuff and American stuff on the other side. Uh, and of course, this is the time period when the West Pediment is put up and you see the English knight and the Roman centurion on the other side. Now there's a decline again in Roman law and Roman lawyering in the US after World War II. Uh, in part, this is because of things that happen outside of the United States. Uh, remember that Germany provided an example to American scholars and lawyers during the earlier period. That model is very unpopular, obviously, after 1945. It is also true that English academic influence in the United States declines during this period. So uh, some of the supporting factors are no longer there. Uh, Latin is also fading away in public schools during this time. So again, the languages are, are going. John Adams would have been extremely disappointed um, because this is really the last remnant. Now, Roman law does endure after 1950 into the 80s and 90s. A, a number of American schools uh, today, there is still a course um, taught by Charles Donahue at, uh, at Harvard Law School. 
uh, who was both my mentor and, and, and Donna's. Uh, at one point, there are also courses uh, taught in Roman law at the University of Washington. I think Minnesota has a course. There are obviously courses in Louisiana, although that's another matter entirely. Uh, <laughs> however, even in these contexts, Cicero is missing. It's all just stinging, basically. All the digest, all the doctrines, that sort of thing. Uh, and really what we're dealing with now and what we're being taught now is Roman law for U.S. jurists, right? U.S. law professors to sort of see themselves as the heirs of the jurists, not as the heirs of Cicero at all, but as the heirs of the jurists, the doctrinalists who elaborated Roman law in various substantive capacities. So where are we now? Where are we now? Well, there is, there are signs of renewed interest uh, in Roman law in some quarters uh, in the United States. Uh, it's hard to know exactly what to make of this. And so this is sort of one approach, but there are other ways of doing it. Um, there are echoes, certainly, of Justinian and doctrinalism. Uh, as it happens, the Federalist Society has taken a very prominent role in pushing some of this. Uh, and you've got Richard Epstein, uh, who is uh, out there publicly talking about the benefits of Roman law. Uh, and in this context, you know, he might be considered part of the Chicago School because that's where he's based doing this kind of work. Um, to some extent, this is actually English influence again, because Epstein comes from Oxford, ultimately, took Roman law when he was there, took it from Alan Watson, I think, in the early 60s. Um, but then he's also with Chicago. So what's happening is that Roman law is actually being used as kind of a stocking horse for law and economics to reinforce that kind of approach. There's a little bit of a present edge to what is being done in that kind of environment. Uh, more recently, Adrian Vermeule, uh, at, uh, at, at Harvard, uh, who's actually the son of a classicist, uh, Emily Vermeule, uh, a classical archaeologist, has, has done some interesting work. And there are echoes of Cicero and, of course, natural law in his most recent work on common good constitutionalism. He's drawing on Roman law more subtly, but it's still perhaps problematic as an actual application of Roman law, because I'm not sure we're really ready for some kind of elaborate discussion of, of Ciceronian ideas and ideals. We just haven't explored that enough ourselves at this particular juncture. So what I want to end with is this. I think that to the extent that there are revivals of interest in Roman law, I guess they're interesting, maybe they're positive, but we might be putting the cart a little bit before the horse here. And I would encourage everybody to you know, do their homework first. Uh, what we really want to do, I think, is go back to Roman law in all of its historical complexity and study it on its terms, right? Not necessarily our terms, right? Look at it for itself. Look at it directly. Uh, not as an instrument necessarily to something else. Maybe it does have other implications, but look at it directly, see what it means. Try your best to do that. Understand it in its own context. And we need to consider its full legacy for law, for justice. We need to think about Justinian. We need to think about Cicero. We need to think about its good parts. We need to think about its bad parts uh, before we do what John Adams did and turn ourselves into Romans. Uh, I think that when we do this, uh, we will probably be delighted in some respects by what we discover. Uh, I think we will be disappointed sometimes in what we discover. Um, but I am sure, just as we are dealing with this book today in the same vein, I'm sure that we will be surprised at what we find and what we learn. And I, in particular, look forward to that part of the journey. Thank you so very much. I'm going to throw it. Thank you so much, Professor Hibbert. I'm going um, ahead to invite the other esteemed member of our panel, and uh, we'll save the questions for the end. I hope that's okay. So next to me, it is my pleasure to introduce Judge Bill Stickman. He is going to present Justinian's Code, a buried treasure awaiting rediscovery. For those of you who don't know Judge Stickman, he attended Duquesne University, where he majored in the classics ancient languages. In 2005, he graduated from Duquesne Klein School of Law. <laughs> Having practiced with Reed Smith, he then served as a judicial law clerk to Chief Justice Ralph Cappy of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Judge Stickman was nominated to serve as a judge of the Western District of Pennsylvania on May 13, 2019. He was confirmed by the Senate on July 31st, 2019, and received his commission on August 5th, 2019. It is my pleasure to add to this um, um, 
brief introduction that Judge Sigmund is a legal scholar and a faculty member in the history department at his alma mater. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, uh, for the invitation to speak today. Um, Pleasure and honor. Well, when I got the call that I could come and talk about an old book, <laughs> it was the feeling in the heart of the nerd, like going downstairs on Christmas morning and seeing presents under the tree. Uh, as my wife, my long suffering wife here, took my tests. Uh, but, you know, I see some of my students here. Uh, uh, Dean Barden, behind you are some of the finest pre law students at Duquesne. So you should talk with them after this event for being the future of Duquesne law. But I told them today that if they got here early enough, they could see a real legal history professor and scholar speak. I'm an amateur, um, but modest. I would add I, no, modest. I'm, 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 I'm an amateur, right? And I've given them that disclaimer since since the first day here. Um, I can vouch, following up on what Professor Hibbett said, that Roman law is very much alive in our system. In my first six months on the bench, I had the opportunity in a case uh, to cite Justinian's institutes as well as Blackstone and some other commentaries on one of the pressing issues of our day how one can claim property rights in a stray cat. Uh, <laughs> the, the case is Madeira versus Lucky, and that's at 439 F sub, 493, in case anybody is interested. I think I've given it to my, my law students here to show the vitality of my pre-law students, the vitality of, of the legal um, heritage that we've inherited from, from Rome. And when I was asked to give a title for my talk today, the title that I thought of was Justinian's Code, A Buried Treasure Awaiting Rediscovery. And of course, I'm referring to this magnificent volume sitting before us now. Uh, it's amazing that as a legal community and as a university, we now have rediscovered this treasure that was in our midst for 110 years and come to, that can come together today to celebrate what it means. But I also believe that the journey that this book has taken in the last 110 years in many respects mirrors the journey that Justinian's legal reform took in the Western legal tradition. And I'll get into that. I think my students here have knowing looks because we've just covered uh, some of these materials. But first, before we get into the big picture, let's look at the microcosm. Let's look at this book that sits before us now. And let's consider the world as it existed when Charles Dollinger donated this book on June 24th, 1910 to the Allegheny County Law Library. At that time, our United States was comprised of 46 states. In Vienna, the Habsburg Emperor sat in nervous splendor, ruling the successor state to the Holy Roman Empire, which claimed descent from the Roman Empire. A little further east, the Third Rome in Moscow, the Tsar, the Caesar, sat reigning in glory. Europe had not yet sunk into the fratricidal nightmare that Pope Benedict XV called the second fall of man, World War I. The old order reigned. Forbes Field was a year old, and the Titanic was two years from, from, from sailing and sinking. And yet, this book sat in storage, forgot it. Time went on. Wars came, nations rose, empires fell. Civilization changed around the world. And this book sat in storage, not being accessed, not being celebrated, forgot it. More time passed. When this book was donated, the Wright brothers invented a novelty of a balsa wood and canvas airplane. People stepped foot on the moon. The Concorde could take you to Europe, where this book comes from in two and a half hours. And yet it sat forgot it, waiting, waiting for its moment to be rediscovered, which happened this year. It happened just this very year. A year ago, this book was sitting there waiting. It was waiting for its moment. And now over a century later, it has brought together in its honor an audience of law students, distinguished scholars, law professors, members of the public to celebrate it, not just for the tangible expression of our Western legal history, but also as a representative of that Western legal history. For just as it's not a foregone conclusion that this book would have been preserved through its decades of obscure storage, 
it's not, it was not a foregone conclusion that Justinian's legal reform would have survived to serve as the foundation, one of the foundational elements of our modern Western civilization. You see, just like this book, Justinian's Code, which was part of the larger body of uh, legal reform called the Corpus Juris Civilis, made up of the Code, the Institutes, the Novelli, and the Digest. Uh, it was not foregone conclusion that it would survive the hard times into which it was born. Professor Hibbett showed a distinction between Cicero and Justinian. Any law student can tell you that the Roman Empire fell in what year? 476, right? 476. We'll tell that to Justinian. Justinian, the Roman emperor, reigning gloriously from the new Rome at Constantinople from 527 to 565, nearly a century after Rome allegedly fell. And Justinian was very much a Roman emperor, as was his distant successor, Constantine XI, Paleologus in 1453. The Byzantine Empire, of course, is a name given by historians. No Byzantine emperor ever considered himself to be such. They were until the last day of that empire on May 28, 1453, Romans. But the Justinian legal reform stemmed from a different Rome than we popularly depict in our movies and in our imagination. It did not stem from the Rome of the aqueducts, the gladiator fights. It did not stem from the Rome of a million people living in a modern city with apartment blocks and restaurants fed by water from the Alps where a quarter of the world's population lived under the Roman standard. No, Justinian's legal reform came from a very different time. And Justinian's legal reform was born into a world that was, as G.K. Chesterton wrote, in the West. In the West, it was a time when Caesar's son had fallen from the sky, and whoso hearkened right could only hear the plunging of the nations in the night. It was a very dark period indeed. When Justinian was ruling from his golden porphyry palace on the Bosphorus, the city of Rome was a shadow of its prior self. Legal institutions in the West had collapsed into uh, what we would view as a street fight sometimes. There were more appeals to the supernatural than there were to evidence. And legal process was, as we should say, unusual to say the least taking the form of dunking in water, hot irons, maybe some oath helpers in the like. So this great reform that Justinian undertook to encapsulate the Roman legal mind, Justinian was not an author and he was not a creator. He was an editor and a redactor. The problem that Justinian solved with his legal reform was that throughout the course of Roman history, in the course of the Roman legal experience, Law was to the Romans what philosophy was to the Greeks. There was too much law. And centuries of additions had left it difficult for lawyers, jurists, and judges to find which law controlled. So Justinian redacted the whole body of Roman law down to those four texts. The Institutes, the Codex, the Novelli, which were rightly forgotten, I think, by modern scholars, <laughs> and the Digest. But most importantly was the Digest. Because while the Codex, of which this is a version, is a com compilation of Roman statutory law. And the Institutes were a book, the first ever porn book published to young enthusiasts for the law. I see some of them here today. It was a legal textbook. The Digest was the grand expression of the Roman legal mind. It explored legal problems and how jurists handled those problems. And from the way they handled those problems, rules that could be then applied to other problems. It did as the professors in this building and down in Pitt say, it taught people to think like lawyers. The Romans were masters of that. But when it was instituted, it was nearly forgotten. It was not received into the West. It was a gift that was given, but not received because the conditions were not yet right for its reception. So like this book sitting for decade upon decade, century upon century past of what we would consider to be very dark times in the West with only the rudiments of courts, a legal profession and a rule of law. But then 
in around the year 1000, the sun began to rise again. When not so much this book, but the, the digest was rediscovered. The Florentines will say they had it first, but it was in Bologna that the study of the Roman legal tradition was reborn. In Bologna, they began the systematic study and teaching, not just of the canon law, but of the Roman law rediscovered. And that drew students from all over Europe. As I told my students just today, at the beginning of the century, there were about a thousand students studying in Bologna, Roman and canon law. 150 years later, there were 10,000 students studying at that institution. And you can imagine that 10,000 students being squeezed into a city the size of the Golden Triangle can be somewhat disruptive at times, <laughs> but it could also be a cash cow. So the city and the band of scholars, the guild of scholars, came into a symbiotic relationship. And the guild of scholars was granted a charter by the city of Bologna to be one of the two, Paris would differ if I say the first, <laughs> one of the two first universities. This book represents a legal tradition that gave rise to our Western university. We are sitting now on land in a building that is the heritage of this legal reform, far beyond the confines of the law. But beyond that, those 10,000 students went home and they went home to the courts of Europe. They went home to receive the wisdom of the Romans as reinterpreted for their time. And as explained by the glosses around this text that you'll see, which we discussed not too long ago in class. And they seeded in each of the capitals of Europe, the roots of the European use commune, the foundations, the common law, although you have to be careful when you say that in a common law country, the common legal principles that form the foundation of every major Western European legal system, and we in the new world who are the inheritors of those traditions. So this book represents a legal tradition that, will, like the book itself, forgotten for centuries, was reborn at the right time in the right place. And in the right time, in the right place, it is the foundation of two great Western traditions, the European civil law and the Western university. It bore fruit that continues to bear fruit in this day. And to that end, I say to anybody that will listen, while it is not beautiful prose. And while it is somewhat obscure and nothing that you would want to read to your children <laughs> or it's not good bedtime reading, Justinian's legal texts are as foundational a pillar of Western civilization as the Iliad, my professor sort of was looking at me skeptically, <laughs> the Odyssey, Augustine, or the traditional Latin mass. It is a foundation of the current West in which we sit, and we are all indebted to it for the intellectual foundation that it left for us. So let's go back to this book as I close. And I guess the question is, do I believe this book could have any impact on us now, just like the rediscovery of the Corpus Juris did for Europe? I surely don't think that our finding this book in the Allegheny County Law Library it's going to lead to a new legal renaissance. It's going to remake legal legal institutions, new fields of law. Hey, we could be optimists. But what I hope that it does do is I hope that it gives us a tangible opportunity to look into our heritage, to look into the treasures that we've inherited. And I hope that what it does is it allows us to contemplate as a university and a legal community that legal history is not some obscure sub niche that's too legal for historians and too historical for law students. Legal history is Western history. And that the legal mind expressed in Justinian's text, as well as Justinian's inheritors like Bracton and Blackstone and the like, are parts of the constitutive mind that makes up our Western civilizational heritage. And I would hope, perhaps, that as we as a university community consider this book, it could help perhaps bridge the gap between the college and the law school to bring together ways we can cooperate to better study for the law school, the historical patrimony of our legal traditions and the parallels of our own legal 
times and moments and practices with those that have been encountered before. And for the college, we can see that the historical path that we have gone down, not just in the past, laid the foundation for our civilization, but continues to do so through its modern incarnation. The texts, but also the men and women that study from those texts, many of whom are in this room today. So that's what I hope for this text. But for now, let's just celebrate the fact that like the Corpus Juris itself, it has survived. It's come down to us and we can enjoy its presence today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judge Stigman. We are moving along and uh, I'm going to introduce a very important person um, in terms of the journey of this book. And this is Tom Juan, who is going to talk to us about the 1488 print creation, provenance, and preservation of this particular book. Tom is the Duquesne University archivist and curator of special collections. And um, he's been here in this position since 2005. He also serves as an adjunct professor of history at Duquesne and teaches history and folklore as an adjunct at Laval University. White is the author of 11 books on Pennsylvania folklore and history. He received his master's in public history here at Duquesne. So I'm giving you time. Thank you for being uh, here. Thanks. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, all that basically means I read dead people's mail, by the way, um, <laughs> in the archives. So um, I'm not a lawyer, but I do specialize in rare materials and the preservation of those materials. So uh, first, I want to talk to you a little bit about the provenance of this book and provenance, you know, meaning the history of its ownership, where it came from, where it was created. Because it's uh, it's, it's uh, pretty interesting, this particular version, and uh, as I did research on it, I found that this 1488 version, which was printed by uh, Anton Koberger uh, in Nuremberg, Germany, which was the center of publishing in the 1400s, uh, really a center of intellectual life in the early Renaissance period in Germany, but also in Europe in general. Now, Koberger was actually, if you're familiar with Albert Dorer, that was his godson, uh, the, the artist Albert Dorer. Uh, and Koberger was an interesting character in and of himself. He was Europe's largest printer and bookseller at the time. And uh, he owned, uh, and this is 1488, so it's only about 30 years into the printing press. He owned two dozen printing presses, which he ran constantly to produce books. And many of the books that came out and were circulated in European libraries in the late 1400s came from Koberger and his presses. Uh, and he would he would inspect them, and we're lucky that this version this this version is from him because he was known for producing very high quality books. And when you get a chance to come up and look at this book, he used very high quality paper, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but also high quality inks and things that have lasted over a long period of time. And Koberger, uh, he owned the two dozen presses, and generally he would print two hundred to a thousand copies when he printed a book, right? So. I don't know how many, I tried to figure out how many copies of this book was printed. Uh, my guess would be, I mean, it wouldn't be a bestseller necessarily, but it would go to certain institutions and monasteries. So a reasonable guess, many of its runs were about 500. Um, so I, you know, it, it, very limited numbers today, you know, by our standards, but even, even fewer when you consider the time and what has survived. So, uh, Koberger, though, married into aristocracy, and he was actually really like the first media baron. Like I said, he controlled distribution of books. I mean, he would look very similar to, uh, I don't want to compare him to Jeff Bezos, but he was like the, 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 the very early prototype of what someone like that would be like. Um, but luckily, he had a distribution network. Um, and it was uh, basically the, the scope and the volume. He was the guy. He was one of the, there was only maybe three or four of these printers in Europe at the time, they really distributed books. And sometimes that's not appreciated how important that is historically, the volume of texts that were produced. It produced so many in those early years up to the Renaissance and books now didn't all just go to monastery libraries or all to cathedrals or all the institutions. Now, some of the slowly emerging middle class would acquire books. And that would have a whole chain reaction throughout history and allow more and more people to get access to education. It would be a gradual process, of course, but it would improve literacy, 
and uh, you know a variety of things. So this is one of the books that was part of that wave of, uh, of production at that time. So as I said, this particular copy was printed in 1488, and it ended up, we don't know exactly what happened to it between 1488 and 1543, but in 1543, it ended up in a monastery at Alto Munster in Bavaria. Now, uh, Alto Munster was a, uh, it has a kind of a unique history of itself. You might think Bavaria, okay, it's German monks. It was founded actually in 750 by an Irish Benedictine monk who had wandered into Germany. If you've ever read the book, How the Irish Saved Civilization, that was that time period when the Irish were redistributing learning back across Europe after when you discussed the kind of what used to be called the dark ages of the West. That's not really accurate, but they just they distribute books and monographs back through into Europe from Ireland. Uh, and that was after the period, after the Synod of Whitby, where these Celtic church and Roman church had merged back together. And so Alto was a Benedictine. And he uh, he formed that monastery. He wandered and found a good spot in Bavaria. That's how it, uh, that's how the monastery was formed. So over the years, it was a Benedictine monastery. It was unique in the sense, up until the Renaissance, it was one of the few monasteries in Europe that continued to house both monks and nuns together in separate buildings. But you know, uh, they would be together on the same property and uh, maintained. And this is important because it wouldn't be the monks that would purchase this book. In fact, by the uh, 1490s, the original monastery was dissolved. And instead, the it was vacant for a few years. And the property was given to the Order of St. Bridget of Sweden, which was a, 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 a dunce, essentially. And the Bridgentines, as they were called, would have been the group that purchased this book for their library. And basically, that order existed in Bavaria until 1803, as far as we know. Now, there's some speculation as to when this book left that library. And there's a letter actually attached in the front by Charles Dollinger that he speculates it was removed during the Renaissance. But what I think is the fact that books from that time period often, because books were valuable, we, we tend to think of these, I mean, this is valuable because it's old. But if you had that book even in Renaissance, that would be like having a Cadillac. That book was more valuable probably than anything you own because of the, the amount of work that went into that, even with the early printing books. And books almost always have the owners inscribed in through the Renaissance up into, it, the process slowly starts to die out in the 1700s, 1800s. But there's no additional owners inscribed in the front of this book. So I suspect the book was removed from the monastery in 1803 when that order was dissolved, went into circulation. And then Charles Dollander, who was a historian, lawyer, businessman and local politician purchased the book uh, sometime in, you know, before 1910 when it was donated to the law school. The Allegheny County. Al Allegheny County, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> uh, Allegheny County Law Library. Um, and, and he gave it to J. Oscar Amrick, who was the county law librarian at the time. Now, uh, Dolliger is also, many people don't realize, he was actually... You know, you think of the Carnegie Library, so you think of Andrew Carnegie throwing money at the library. It was Charles Dollinger that actually helped facilitate setting up the free Carnegie Free Library system. And as a historian, uh, he, he was very interested in rare materials, helped procure rare, rare materials for these libraries and for institutions around Pittsburgh. Uh, he, he unfortunately died in 1935, um, but uh, he had donated this book you know, in 1910. So that's how the book got in, and of course, uh, you covered the rest of uh, what happened with the book after, and it kind of went into hiding, essentially, you could say, you want to say it nicely. But you know, it was basically put away and disappeared. And often you'd see that with resources at that time, because unlike today, there wasn't necessarily a sense. The sense was simply to preserve it or save it, put it away, and not necessarily make it accessible. But of course, you learn things from when you make these books accessible. So that is the history of the book. But um, I want to tell you a little bit about its physical features uh, as an archivist. And this isn't nearly as exciting as, as their, their talks. But um, so the book, first of all, one thing you'll notice when you walk up, and if we, when, we can open the cover later, uh, the book is has a brittle of tiny holes. And that's classic examples of bookworms, which were common in these old books. 
uh, many people never get to see those. Uh, in fact, I've met people who didn't realize that bookworms were a real thing, which I thought was some cute term made up, but it was common in these books from, from that time period. So we'll see bookworms uh, th throughout that book. But the interesting thing, if you walk up and look at this book, uh, you know, and, and one of the reasons it was so valuable, you look at the lettering and there's different um, uh, typesets that were used throughout this time period. And I don't know specifically which one that is, but they were, they were all difficult to read. Um, but, you know, it's one thing we, we often take for granted. One of the reasons these are valuable is someone sat there and put every single one of those letters into a press. One at a time, that entire book was assembled on printing sheets and multiple copies of the run. You know, and they didn't usually do a reprint because no one was putting all those back. You know? um, so you did the one run and that was it, you know, and then you would be additional uh, you do one run in blacking, for example, and you see red flourishes in the book, and so they go back and put it in the red flourish marker and press it with that, and you would have um, well, another layer of color. There's also a handful of small woodcuts throughout the book. They're very small. They're, they're, they're smaller than you usually see, but they kind of accent the book in various areas. And the ones on the first page were actually painted and gilded. So there's some, some gilding on them and they're painted two squares. And you often see that on printed books. You know, that was common on illuminated manuscripts. You see it on printed books in the early Renaissance because for years, for decades, you had hundreds of monks in monasteries that hand copied manuscripts. Well, now they're kind of becoming unemployed with the printing press. <laughs> so what they often would do, since they didn't necessarily have to write the book, you know, transcribe the book anymore, they would help decorate the book. So they would take black and white woodcuts colorize them, gild them. And so often you'll see multiple copies of books with different decorated woodcuts. And that was something you know, commonly you can see depending on where the book came from. And so, uh, you know, in the paper, if you look at the paper today, and you know, most people don't realize, I mean, that paper, you know, in this book is rare, but one of the reasons it survived because that paper is far superior to anything you're writing on now. That paper was, uh, it, it only recently had, Western Europe, but they changed over from vellum or, or parchment, you know, uh, animal skin, essentially stretched animal skin to true paper. And that made it was easier with the printing presses to run true paper through. And that would be made with uh, what they often call rag paper, it'd be long fiber paper. So the fibers are very long in the paper, intertwined. And so when they fold and they bend, it doesn't break. Modern paper is made with wood pulp and very short fibers held together with very acidic material. And so that's why modern paper breaks apart and breaks down easily. Like that copy of the Duquesne Duke, if you left it out in the sunlight for two or three days, it'll start to turn yellow already. Those book, that book, that paper was very white. That that paper will outlast all, if properly cared for, that paper will be here in a thousand years still, if properly cared for. So, um, you know, one of the, the, the great things about looking at these old books is just that the craftsmanship the way shift the one into them. And the cover is actually, this is also rare because of the cover. So most rare books, the covers don't survive. They rebound. This book has the original wood board covers with the original calfskin stretched over, which is very unusual in that time. Um, and, you know, you don't see that very often. And often what happens is, is you have what's called red rot. If you ever pick up a really old book and there's like powder coming off in your hands, that's what, because the binding is made of leather and it's decomposing over time. But in this case, the binding has survived and has original wood, wood uh, thick wood board covers. So, um, you know, generally though, this is a, this is an excellent example of, of uh, a book surviving. I mean, it's just as an artifact, it's a fantastic, fantastic thing to, to look at. If you're interested in books, I'm assuming everyone here is interested in law, but if you're even if you're not, you don't have to tell them. But <laughs> but you can look at it as an artifact, as a, as you know, as a book, and uh, enjoy and see the craftsmanship that went into these old these old texts. But a lot can be learned from them. They're also full of handwritten notes. That's one of the reasons why every one of these books is different. That the keepers of these books would inscribe their own notes and commentary in addition to the other commentary that they have the book. And you can see kind of layers, and often it's anonymous, so it's some monastic figure in an institution, but you can see what they were what they were writing in the margin. So I guess at, at that point, uh, would you like me to allow people to look at the conference? Yes. yes, I think um, um, sooner we'll do that. I want to thank you and. Uh, I don't know. <laughs>
And uh, we are approaching um, uh, almost the end of, um, of the uh, event. And I'm going to briefly uh, remark on the relevance of Roman law in the 21st century gospel curriculum. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to say the Romans lived thousands of years ago, thousands of miles away from the Americas, and used the language now dead, Latin. So why would a 21st century American law student have any interest in learning about Roman law? And here we've heard, um, I, I think, very compelling arguments about why that should happen. I'm going to add a few to this manifold interest. First, from a global perspective, Roman law gives all students an entry into the history behind the codification of the so-called continental civil law legal system. Second, not only is Roman law the bedrock of the so-called continental civil law system, but also the common law Anglo-American system. And I do have examples for that. Um, and uh, the second point is the focus of my presentation. Third, Roman law has been incorporated both in the Supreme Court jurisprudence as amply discussed in the work of Duquesne's own Professor Samuel Astorino. And um, uh, in law school curricula, through uh, such courses, um, <clears throat> although such courses are rarely viewed as mainstream offerings, through such courses we get an idea of how Roman law is still alive. For all these reasons in a world more and more connected where large law firms and corporations have offices around the globe, covered by various legal systems, perhaps studying what connects these diverse legal systems needs a new uh, reassessment. So um, I'm going to briefly mention Roman law, the founding fathers and America's slavery institution. Usually Roman law is presented as an academic subject limited to legal history and of esoteric interest as a matter of theory. But perhaps this limited approach has never told the whole story of the Roman law perception within the American legal realm. If we start with our Republic's founding fathers, as we heard already, their education was filled with Roman law influences. We haven't heard of Jefferson, but Jefferson seems to have been familiar with Roman law, mostly through the works of Shakespeare. He was fascinated with the Catalan on the treason trial through the play Julius Caesar. Moreover, John Adams idolized the Republican Roman jurist. I'm going to call him Cicero. <laughs> so <clears throat> popular, awarded the Dieter uh, Prize as a Harvard Law student, Adams, was asked to choose a book as his reward. He chose um, uh, Conyers Middleton's life of Cicero, popular at the time. In 63 BC, as a consul, Cicero made his name prosecuting the January 6th event of his time, the Catalan sedition trial. James Madison, too, was a student of Roman Republicanism, though, through the French work of Montesquieu, considerations on the causes of the greatness of the Romans and their decline. But perhaps the most telling and tragic connection between all 99 men who signed the Declaration of Independence and Roman law was the institution of slavery, which none saw as a Republican obstacle, probably because how Roman law treated it. Roman slaves could engage in businesses, save money under the legal institution of peculia, so that they could purchase their freedom. Moreover, once free, the Roman slaves could become citizens enjoying the lay of status and so forth. None of them translated here in our legal system. But <clears throat> I'm going to pass over it. Maybe we can find a way of publishing this on some blog, Professor Evans, or we'll see. I want to just bring about continuing the work of my predecessor, um, Professor Astorino. I searched all the Roberts Court opinions mentioning either Roman or Justinian and found 14 opinions meaningfully incorporating or referencing the Roman roots of several common law institutions, such as res judicata, estoppel, double jeopardy protection, trademark law, and even our beloved concept of the rule of law. All this uh, embrace of Roman law by the court is worth noting because it comes from originalist justices whose interpretation of the legal norms goes against the spirit of Roman law a sophisticated tool of governing an ever-changing reality and not an obstacle for preventing the evolution of political, juridical, and social mores according to some ideological motivation of those charged with its application. 
So what I'm saying is that Roman law was as pragmatic as our common law. And for those of you who know about predators and how they made law, you had a problem, you went to a predator, and they gave you a particular civil action, and you could get the money if Jeff Stickman didn't pay me for whatever he asked me to do. <laughs> So um, this is all I want to do because I want to finish by one o'clock and uh, give um, uh, all of you the opportunity to take a look at the book and ask us questions. And once again, I want to thank my dean for allowing me this opportunity to create this uh, um, event. Uh, dean Sarah Barron from Bumber and uh, Tom White for allowing us to preserve this book and share it with uh, all the um, legal scholars and uh, students of law and students of history. And of course, Professor Phyllis from Pitt, trying, maybe we're going to see more, um, you know, interconnected events in the future. And of course, our own Jack Stigma. So thank you, everyone.